Welcome to this chapter 5 presentation where we're looking at the physical and cognitive development that occurs in human beings during this childhood period and how the developing physical self is linked to these changing developments in the brain. Alright, grab coffee, a nice comfy chair, or, you know, download it and go for a walk. And uh, let's let's get do a deep dive into this. Nice to be back with you. Sorry that this uh, presentation is a couple of days delayed, but uh, I think this is going to be a good one. And uh, let's get into it. The main focus of this presentation is going to be looking at the physical development of the brain and how that changes during childhood. But I think it's also important to contextualize that with the kind of broader physical development that the child's going through. So during childhood, we see that both boys and girls, we see this slimming of the trunk, right? Quite li literally a lengthening of the body. Um, we see that the head is still large for the body proportionally. If you remember last time we were talking about how when the baby's first born, the head is very disproportionate size-wise to the rest of the body. And if you've ever seen a baby, you'll have noticed that. It's quite obvious that the child is born you can just really see how the whole, I've made this point a few times, but how the whole birth process is really prioritizing the baby being born with as strong as a potential to have as, uh, as powerful of a brain as possible. But by the end of preschool, most children have lost that kind of top heavy look. We also start to see that the body fat starts this kind of slow, steady decline during the preschool years. So the, the kids losing a lot of what's kind of commonly called baby fat. We actually start to see like a real slimming of the face and stuff like that. This middle and late childhood kind of, so you kind of, this is kind of really interesting when you're looking at physical development. It, there's like a lot happening at the beginning. And then there's kind of a slowing period <clears throat> before the, you know, storm of puberty that's coming. So it's like, it kind of looks like the, the two periods of massive activity or right at the beginning and then puberty and we also start to see that the child starts to get stronger quite literally physically stronger this increase in muscle mass and this increase in muscle strength and that later in today when we start talking about the development of things like fine motor skills and the ability to use tools and stuff like that Part of that is connected with this idea of they're just literally getting stronger. Their muscle mass is increasing and their tone of their muscle is increasing. Their muscles are becoming more functional. Hey, what's up? So you guys are thinking, and I don't know, I can hear you saying like, Mike, come on, we, what's with the chitter chatter? Let's get to some discussion of the brain and the mind. And uh, I thought you'd never ask. So... At a certain point, we're talking about physical development, but although this physical development and physical growth is at some point obvious, it's these unseen changes in the brain and in the nervous system specifically that are, speci that are especially significant in preparing kids for the advances in their cognition and for the advances in their language that are coming down the road. So today we're going to be looking a lot on this idea of uh, of language and cognition, right? And how these things develop. Sorry that there's this like, you know, flashlight at a campfire effect here, but I got the light coming down because I got a bunch of notes and uh, yeah, it's creating a kind of weird lighting effect, but I'm going to just roll with it. Okay. Anyways, I didn't need to say that maybe, but what's up? Nice to see you. So overall, the brain does doesn't really hugely increase in size from the ages of three to five, but what changes is more the patterning, the patterns within the brain. So the formations and the connections, right? Earlier in this course, we used the terminology of the neuro con, the neuro connectivity, like how connected the neurons in the brain are. So it's not necessarily what I mean by that is. It's not just the actual size is getting bigger this way. It's that the complexity within the size is getting, uh, is increasing. This increased maturation of the brain or the brain maturing, like what I was talking about, combined with 
increasing opportunities to experience some widening world as the child's starting to become more mobile and more interacting with things it contributes to this child's emerging cognitive abilities. So that's a kind of loaded, interesting sentence. It's saying the child's mind that's developing is developing within this context of their interaction with the social world. And they're developing physical brain. It's, it's hard to like separate those two things. They're, they're, they're co develop. Well, they're, it's developing within that context. Again, it's just like I've said this a lot of times in this course, this is just another way of saying the nature nurture thing. So, yes, yeah, so check with this. So the amount of brain material in some areas of the brain can nearly double in as little as a year. And what we actually see is, this is like such an interesting concept about the brain. It's that it overproduces and then it prunes. So it's like it builds more relationships than it's going to need more. I, I use the word there, relationships, and you can think of it that way. But the more correct word is connections or neuro connections, neuro connectivity. And it's forming more of those. And as it is, it's, pr it's cutting away or pruning is the word they use in cognitive psychology. It's pruning away the parts it doesn't need anymore. And as it does that, the brain's becoming a more functioning machine. Although the brain doesn't grow as rapidly during childhood as it during infancy, it undergoes remarkable changes. By repeatedly obtaining brain scans of the same children for up to four years, researchers have found that children's brains experience a rapid, distinct spurt of growth. The overall size of the brain doesn't increase dramatically from three to five, like I was saying there. But what does change is this dramatically, uh, the local patterns within the brain. So this, these neural connections, the amount of brain material in some areas can nearly double in a year. So that's the point I have up there. But the important part is this concept of pruning. So I have, this is kind of just like a poetic or whatever way of saying it. It's reminiscent of a sculptor who chips away at the unneeded material to produce the refined work of art. That's not my quote, that's from the textbook. But yeah, that's like the idea, right? It's like the brain overproduces content. That's actually like everything. If you actually, in psychology, we have labels for things, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're saying like, like the, it doesn't necessarily get to the majesticness of what we're actually talking about. That the brain basically overproduces, knowing that some of it's going to be pruned. You might be asking, like, what do I mean by knowing? But, like, deeply embedded in... Yeah, the brain is just, you know, it's the most fascinating thing in the known universe. The only organ that can think about itself... And that thinking about itself comes from this prefrontal cortex. So what we see is that from the ages of three to six, the most rapid growth is in this prefrontal cortex. So now think about this idea for a sec. This is super cool. And it's like this idea that the prefrontal cortex or this, you know, um, right above your eyes, basically, it's like this is the part of the brain that is so you see this huge activity here. And then once this is established, it starts to direct a lot of the activity after that so it's like once that gets to a certain amount of power it kind of takes over and i'll say that in more scientific ways as we get in here but that's kind of the quick way of explaining it is as this part of the, the most advanced part of your brain starts to reach a certain threshold it starts to take over a lot of the process yeah the prefrontal cortex in some ways it's the most interesting thing there is your prefrontal cortex is the only reason you can understand what i'm saying right now mine is the only reason i can say what i'm saying right now it's you could make an argument that what are two you know this is going to sound crazy but like me and whoever you are at the current point as the listener my students obviously but like each of you individually it's our it's our prefrontal cortex is communicating through our my vocal system and your auditory system. That is a weird thought that I didn't have written down. So 
let me say this in a more scientific, less kind of uh, three coffees deep rambly way. From the ages of three to six, the most rapid growth in the brain takes place in the part of the frontal lobes called the prefrontal cortex. This fact leads researchers in developmental cognitive neuroscience to propose that the prefrontal cortex likely orchestrates the functions of many other regions of the brain in later development. So think what that means. That's a way cleaner way of saying what I was rambling about there, that basically this advanced part emerges and then sort of starts to take over the show. I'll say it again how they said it. Leading researchers to propose that the prefrontal cortex orchestrates the functions of many other brain regions during development. Like an orchestra, the brain functions much better with an excellent conductor. Again, those aren't, that's like the other one. That's not my sentence. That's, that's a quote from the book. I just liked it. So this prefrontal cortex, you'll almost get giddy every time I talk about it. From a psychology perspective, this is in a lot of ways one of the more interesting parts of the brain, right? Especially if we're talking about things like cognitive psychology, because this is where the decision making is happening. This is where our conscious um, engagement with our reality is. Though the total brain volume stabilizes by the end of late childhood, we see significant changes in various structures and regions in the brain. As children develop, activation in some brain areas increase while it decreases in others. So that's just this kind of way of saying your brain's developing almost it's it's not like it's all on the exact same timeline. It's almost like different parts are they use the term here activating in different at different speeds and in different ways. Sometimes at certain stages in development we all of a sudden see a lot of activity in say the prefrontal cortex. This is gonna be the example here. Um in one study Researchers found less diffusion and more focal activation in the prefrontal cortex between 7 and 30 years of age. The shift in activation was accompanied by increased cognitive performance, especially cognitive control. So when we actually see when you when you compare a 7 year old to a 30 year old and it's like. If I was to say, do you think who do you think would win in being able to pay attention longer, a 7 year old or a 30 year old on average? You know, and I was like, if you're right, you get a hundred dollars. So I gave you some incentive to be right. All of you would cho choose the 30 year old. But if I said, okay, explain why, what is it specifically neurologically that makes you pick the 30 year old? Well, it's because they've had increased activation in the prefrontal cortex and it actually has this cognitive effect. This shift in activation is accompanied by this increased efficiency in cognitive performance, especially things like cognitive control. So we're going to, and you've heard this idea before, you've heard probably this concept of um, why people when they're like teenagers and stuff take more risks. And why you see this like huge dip in risk taking behaviors once people get into their mid twenties and you'll hear people say things like, it's because of the prefrontal cortex not developing until you're kind of in your early 20s and what people sometimes don't highlight is an important piece to know about that is when they're saying it's not fully developed what they're really saying is that myelination that protective coating on the outside of the neurons isn't fully developed yet so it's like the brain's building and as it's getting stronger and then it's adding this protective layer to the strong connections and that's kind of like your brain getting more complex. That's your cognitive development. I'll keep going on this because this, this concept is uh, really important. Let me just put these up. So in case you're jotting down notes at home, you can just kind of do it at your own speed. And I'll just talk for a sec here because I have some stuff to read. So again, remember, and I know I, uh, at the risk of being a bit repetitive, I think it, it bears repeating. So it's like your neurons in your brain are like the electrical wire piece of this cord. The myelinization is basically a fat layer on the outside of the core that protects it. 
It's an insulator. In addition to changes in patterns of activation, myelination continues throughout childhood. Recall that myelination is this process by which the axons or the nerve fibers, uh, sorry, the nerve fibers that carry away signals from the neurons in the brain are covered with this fatty layer of cell. And so this is, says another interesting point that and I haven't said this yet, and I should have said this earlier, that once that neuron then has that shield around it, that insulative myelinith sheath, it actually, the myelinous sheath, it actually um, increases the speed that the neuron can fire. So it, it's make it's increasing the uh, it's increasing the efficiency of the brain. Like really, if you sit back and think about it, how cool is that? This myelination is important in the development of a number of ability in the development of a number of, of abilities, but the timing of myelinization varies across brain regions. For example, myelinization in the areas of the brain related to eye-hand coordination is not complete until about four years of, old, of age. Now, it's interesting because I never even thought about this while preparing this, but my daughter's recently, uh, now she's like, she's been, she turned four at the beginning of September. And her ability to catch and like basically play sports is significantly different now than even just mid-summer. So that's just anecdotal. That's just one story of one person, my daughter. But it's interesting because it kind of plays right into that, like her ability to just like catch and bring her hands together at the right time. Because catching is actually kind of complex. Not only do you have to read the situation right visually, it's like, like it says here, eye hand, right? Eye hand coordination, coordinating what you're seeing with your, your sensory motor is the word we use in psych. Myelinization in the areas of the brain related to focusing your attention is not complete until the end of middle or late childhood. So see how I'm, I'm saying like myelination around eye-hand coordination is at like four. Myelination around um, attention isn't until middle or late childhood. And, my, and myelinization of many aspects of this prefrontal cortex, especially those parts that are associated with higher levels of thinking, like decision-making, uh, weighing risk and consequence is not complete until late adolescence or early adulthood. Now here's something kind of interesting because there's actually something that affects this in a quite interesting way and it's exposing children to music and the effect that that has. Um, I'm not very musical myself but you know, after reading a bunch of this research and just, I think there's an, definitely an argument to be made for exposing kids to music. Um, so, for example, this is from Montreal. Researchers at McGill and Concordia University discovered that early music lessons before the age of seven have a long lasting effect on the brain. So what they did is they basically made three groups. They made a group of, stu of kids that had been getting music lessons from bef since they were before since they were younger than seven, kids that started after they were seven, and then kids that hadn't had any, right? And then I think they had variables about, because obviously, like, there's going to be huge differences, because some, some person might have started at five and been training once a month, and someone else might have started at five and been training every day. So there's obviously, like, a frequency variable there somewhere. I think it says this, actually. Oh, yeah. The two groups were matched for years of experience. That's just a way easier way of saying that. So the researchers compared three groups. Groups, individuals with no music lessons, individuals who started music lessons before the age of seven, and individuals who started after seven. Participants performed a behavioral uh, task that measured their timing as their brains were being scanned using an fMRI machine. The group that started music training before the age of seven outperformed the other two groups on the behavioral tasks and had greater connectivity in the part of the corpus callosum that connects the motor regions in the right and left hemispheres of the brain. So it's, it's almost saying that where you actually physically see this effect is in the connective part between the hemispheres. Neat, right? So 
I think you, you probably know this, but I'll just say this to, uh, the, in this context, the word gross means big. So gross motor skills, um, excuse me if I've made this comment before, but the only really other place you see people say this is if someone makes some outlandish claim and someone's like, that's a gross over exaggeration, meaning it's like a huge gross in this context means big, right? So if I ask you some kind of question on the, the quiz about, um, identifying something as a gross motor versus fine motor, gross motor is going to be a big thing like walking or crawling or sitting up, or it's not going to be something like smaller, like holding a pen. That's a fine motor skill. As children move their legs with more confidence and carry themselves more purposefully, they start to move around their environment and things start to become more automatic. Around the age of three, children start to enjoy simple movements like hopping and jumping and running back and forth just for the sheer delight. Right, they, and that, that's like so true of my daughter. Like she's just like the other day she was, um, sorry, I know I talk about her a lot, but anyways, the other day she was like, Hey daddy, watch what I can do. And I'm like, what? what? And she's like, she just stands on one leg, counts till eight. She's like, I can stand on one leg for eight seconds. It's like, I'm like, that's okay. That's awesome. That's so random that that's what you wanted to show me. But it's like she's learning her um, athleticism and physicality. At age four, children still enjoy the same kind of activities, but they start to also become more adventurous. They start to scrum scramble over things like jungle gyms or playgrounds as they start to, you know, display this athletic prowess. Although they've been able to climb stairs with one foot, for some time by this stage at four at this age of four you start to see kids more um going one foot at a time downstairs which is uh, a more balanced demanding movement than upstairs all right so it just all that means is it just takes more coordination and balance to for a kid to go one step at a time down than it does to go up and so when so being able to do it down is like a higher level of development. You're like, yeah, I'm like, we know you said that like three times. All right, cool. Next slide. So then the contrast to that is um, fine motor skill. Right. So fine motor skill is this idea of like, well, just it's it's more technical. It's more specific. It's more um, nuanced. It's more connected with the visual system too. That's really interesting. Well, they both are, but fine motor skills especially are highly connected. We see that this is, you know, um, linked to, well, some, again, it's like what with the brain isn't linked to your visual system, but things with eye hand is like so much of it is how you're using your hands in relation to how you're making sense of the world. Like whether we're talking about writing or catching a ball or, um, whatever you're doing, taking a drink with a cup. At age five, we see the hand and arm and body all start to move together under the command of the eye. And all of a sudden I throw Evelyn a ball and she's like this. I don't have to be like, okay, hold, like, cause now at this stage, I'm like, okay, start in a catch position. Right. So I try to get her to like, start from this. This is how you can teach a kid, right? You almost like have them almost already caught the ball. And then you like basically give them just like the most perfect pass. And then it's about just getting them to close a bit to so eventually they're like, right. Eventually it's just, they see it. And anyone that plays sports knows this. It's like, if you've played basketball at all and I throw you a ball, you don't think right hand, left hand angle, you just, you just grab it. You just develop the, that ability to respond with your hands to your eyes, eye hand coordination, which we say all the time, but is actually a pretty neat idea. We see this improvement in fine motor skills with, with an increased, um, yeah, as the kid gets into this kind of middle and late childhood, this increased coordination, as we keep saying, is this is all kind of linked with this myelinization. And this idea of myelinization is like kind of the most unhyped part of brain development it's like the coolest part of your brain that people don't talk about a lot is like yeah it's building the new connections but it's also then um protecting them and stabilizing them by the time a kid gets to this like 
10 to 12 stage, they start to show the ability to manipulate similar to an adult. So I mean by manipulating, like, meaning like um, being able to use tools and, you know, write cursively and stuff like that. So manipulate objects. And I think that the research is pretty clear that girls tend to outperform boys in fine motor skills early on. Which is an interesting, um, I don't know wh how that would link to specifically the myelinization. I don't know what, if there's a gender difference there. Um, that'd be an interesting thing to look into the why for that. The, the evidence is pretty clear from that from a developmental perspective, but the kind of if you had the question of evolutionarily, why would that be the case? Um, first of all, that'd be an interesting question. I don't know off the top of my head. I'd just be speculating, but cool area of a potential future project if you're interested. Okay, next slide. So today you might be... Piaget has this idea, right, of the, how a child's cognition develops and one, the first stage is this pre-operational. So I want to talk a little bit about what that even means and we've, we've defined this and we've made notes about this in earlier chapters and I think um, you've heard me make the point before that I think Piaget's not given the due that he uh, deserves in the kind of history of psychology. But um, this is a really a deep idea. I think to understand Piaget, I wanted to tell you this and how it links to something else we're going to talk about today. That, you know, you hear people talk about an IQ test and what an IQ test is. And the two people that developed the IQ test are um, a person whose last name is Simon and a person whose last name is Binet, like B-I-N-E-T. So it's the Binet-Simon IQ test. And then later, we're going to talk about it today, but later it gets kind of updated at Stanford. So now it's called like the Stanford Binet um, IQ test, but it comes from the work of these two people. Carl, I mean, not Carl Jung, uh, Piaget, was working for Simon. So remember, it was Simon and Binet that created it. Piaget was working for Simon. So now, think of what Piaget was doing. So this guy's creating an IQ test. So what he's trying to do is like, the Simon guy's trying to create uh, Theodore Simon. He's trying to create a test. So he's giving kids all these answers and he's seeing like how, what the average kind of answer is for kids at different ages. And Piaget gets really interested in this like weird angle of this. And he starts to notice that kids he starts to become interested basically in the wrong answers and that there's like patterns in wrong answers and that kids tend to make wrong answers in almost predictable ways it's like he started to know what am i trying to say that the wrong answers weren't random that there was a pattern there and it was almost a predictable pattern based on how they were making sense of the question and that how old they were seemed to affect that and so he started to develop this idea that maybe what the reason why they're having these kind of predictably wrong, but not only just wrong, but wrong in a predictable type of thinking error, error that that's actually where he came to this model. So it's his development of the cognitive steps, stages of development is intimately connected with the development of the IQ test. While conducting intelligence tests with Theodore Simon, uh, Piaget didn't simply record what errors children made. Instead, he was captivated by the responses and noted that young children responded in a qualitatively different way than older children and adults. Okay, so to kind of explain what I'm talking about here, we're going to look at three specific ideas from Piaget's um, theoretical perspective. We're gonna look at this idea of egocentrism, animism, and conservation, okay? And this, we're gonna use this to kind of get at this idea because Piaget wasn't just like, let me tell you about how kids think. He was, and what makes him so neat is he was like, let's develop tests to show what I mean. I'll show you what I mean. And over this next uh, little piece of this presentation, I'm gonna show you what Piaget meant. So if we look at this, so before we define egocentrism, 
we should maybe say first what centrism is or centration is or or to have something in the center and to be focused our attention from kind of a centralized position that we're not randomly interpreting things we're interpreting things from an angle we focus our attention on one characteristic we're looking at something you know even human beings just we're we're an aiming we're a targeting creature right if you look at i'm sorry if i've said this before but i find this an interesting point it's like if you look at the difference between prey and predatory animals right so like uh humans are in the column of predatory animals like like a wolf or like a bear where our eyes are on the front and, and where we aim which is very different than like a deer or um other prey animals where their eyes are on the side for more peripheral vision it's like human beings are targeting our visual system is massively prioritized by our brain so we're almost at this like cognitive bias towards over valuing our visual perspective especially for this young child right so now these are things that have to be connected here so the point i'm trying to make is centrism is this idea of like kind of seeing things from your perspective and having that dominating remember we're talking about a child's mind right so then egocentrism and this is why i wanted to make the point of what centrism meant first because then it's important to remember that ego here is the old use of the word the way that it was used at the beginning of psychology where we were talking about ego is like that part of you that's you that part of mike that's me that's not just my memory or um my uh physical body or whatever that part of my kind of psychological identity that i identify with is like my higher self or my actual self that that psychological ego and at the beginning of psychology it was sometimes called ego psychology right and like you want to see some interesting stuff about that a lot of anna freud's work freud's daughter's works on that kind of stuff what is the the nature of the ego i think that's the name of her book so then this idea of egocentrism means like viewing things almost from our perspective so much that it creates cognitive air <clears throat> piaget and okay so egocentrism yeah egocentrism i think i have that written there yeah the inability to distinguish between one's own perspective and someone else's right so the inability for the child to assume that not everybody's seeing it the way they are it's why like you're driving in the car and you have a two-year-old in the back seat and you're in crazy traffic and it's really stressful and they're screaming at you because they dropped their toy and they want you to pass it to them and you want to just be like you want to just like yell like don't you understand that like i'm trying to like keep us safe and this is a stressful situation and can you just wait it's like no they can't understand that they can't take your perspective it's a two-year-old they're they even if they wanted to they couldn't cognitively put themselves in your shoes it's an interesting point right um or at least i think it is and it's like because it's so because you when you're and i'm a parent and i know some of you might be too or it's like it's it it, it, make, it helps you be a little more patient when you realize like yeah like they're, they're not she evelyn my daughter's not thinking about how it's affecting me she can't take she can't that's too complex that's operationalizing actually and she's pre-operational the language from the last slide her taking my perspective is would be her manipulating and 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 that manipulation is what piaget called operationalizing right just to kind of help with the language here piaget and and barbell inhelder so that's just another scientist so this is in 1969 initially studied young children's egocentrism by devising this three mountain task that you see there on the slide <laughs> the child walks around a table with a model of the mountains and becomes familiar with what the mountains look like from different perspectives and they see that there's different objects on the mountains the child is then sit seated on one side of the mountains okay so you basically take the kid around and you show them all the different angles right so you can kind of see there's like say you had <clears throat> did they say that they actually sit down 
Yeah. So they basically have like, I guess you'd have like four chairs around this table and there's spot A. And when you're, you know, looking from spot A, you see, it looks like um, the two smaller ones are in front. The one with the cross is on the left. Then when you're looking at image two, it looks like, well, actually both of them now are on the left. The, you know what I mean? So it's like the different perspectives, obviously. You know what perspectives are. But again, remember, this is a test of children. The child's then seated at one of the spots. The experimenter then takes a doll and sets it at one of the other chairs. And at each location, so it's as it sets it at different locations, it shows the kid pictures of those four spots and asks the kid, basically, what do you think the doll sees? Now, the interesting thing is the kid tends to, depending on age, will, will tend to say, well, I'll just read this. Children in the pre-operational stage often pick their own view rather than the doll's view. Right. So because they're not able to take that shift of perspective, because Evelyn can't be like, oh, this might must be this must be like stress must be kind of adding confusion to dad by asking for this doll to be picked up now while he's in this stressful situation. She's not doing that. The kids not putting themselves in that position. They're saying, I see this. They must see this. They're not at that theory of mind. They're not at that operational level yet. Yeah, so this is called the three mountain task. So this is one of Piaget's experiments. So uh, I actually have a, a pretty good example of this that just happened today. So animism is just this idea of treating things that like are inanimate or not alive as if they have life-like qualities, right? The dog example there is not the greatest because it, but the, the idea there is like treating the dog like it's a person, right? So my, my daughter today was like, uh, she has these, if you've, have you ever heard of the mute movie Frozen? Just joking, but my daughter watches that like all the time, like a lot of kids. And, uh, so she has like her Anna, she'd get mad if I said Anna, but Anna, I think and uh elsa or elsa bell or whatever and so like she has her two dolls and first of all she would have got so mad if i got those names wrong but uh she had them up she usually brings them down so like i think i've told you this before but maybe i'll do it sometime but if i would turn the camera around in here on this side there's my desk and over here there's some bookshelves and stuff and then on that side the other side of the room there's like a couch and chairs and a tv and it's where like i um hang out with my daughter we call it like the our our TV area or movie area or whatever, right? Just a rec room. But anyways, so she usually has those toys down there and plays with them at night and stuff. So today I was like, hey, where are your dolls? And she's like, oh, they're up in my room, but don't worry. They're coloring. Did you catch that? So she told me that her, her dolls, is not to worry, they're fine. They're coloring, right? And I went up and got them for her and they're like sitting there on her. She has a, like a little desk in her room actually got her like one of those old school school desks and uh um they're, they're sitting there like on top of her desk with, pa with paper it's like I, if you really asked her she knows they're not real things but it's actually showing this this is like one step before theory of mind this is almost like one step before theory of mind is i'm going to show something about that in a sec but that idea of being able to take that perspective they're playing with that ability. It's a very important developmental step. Okay, so, so far we've looked at two of these three things, um, these three Piaget experimental examples. So this third one is called something called the Beaker Test. So I'll just kind of explain it by looking at the picture, give you a second to write this down and then um, I'll, I'll just, I, there's just a piece I want a little write up on it. So basically the idea is you present to the kid these two cups with water. So what you see on the screen there is A and B. And you make sure that you show the kid that they're the same. There's the same amount of liquid in both of those cups. And then you take a third cup, C, which is smaller, or sorry, that is thinner and taller. And you pour the liquid from B into C. And then you ask the kid which one has more. And what you find is that up until a predictable age or within 
a certain amount of uh, predictability by age, you can kind of understand or you can predict how the kid's going to respond. That younger kids tend to fail this cognitive task. They actually don't do well at conservation, understanding that that same amount of liquid exists, even though it switched, it switched uh, shape or form. I'll show you some some of this uh, conservation examples like on the next slide. But the main idea here is they weren't able to look at this con this something that you would easily as an adult be able to understand that if you just poured C back into B, it would then be again the exact same amount as A. So A and C must be the same. They're not at that level of operationalization yet. Right, so I thought you'd find this interesting. So these are some other examples of scenarios where it's how you visually present it changes how they're going to answer. Right, so if you ask, the, if you show them those two things at the top, these two identical rows of objects are shown to a child who agrees they have the same number. One row is then linked, and the child's asked which one has more objects. Right, and they're going to say the one on the right because it's taking up more room. Or the same thing tends to happen, so that's around numbers. The same thing tends to happen around volume, or sorry, around, yeah, matter. Two identical balls of clay are shown to the child. The child agrees that they look equal in size. The experimenter then changes it by flattening the one, then asks which, which one has more clay. They'll pick the site, the one on the right. right. Same thing with length. You change how the sticks are presented, and all of a sudden they pick the one. Right, so... The, this is what I'm saying is they're failing like the ability to in their mind be like because you look at that and you look at the balls on the right and you can with your mind put them almost back in order and see that it's the same as the left. The easiest example to explain that would probably be the sticks right like in your mind you can pretty easily push that right top one back over and see it's basically the same then it would be the exact same as that side boom. Right, but that's an operate. That's a cognitive operation that allowed you to do that. And remember, these kids are pre-operational child's answers at the top right of that um, diagram or image. So earlier in the course, we've talked, we've touched on Vygotsky and his zone of proximal development, or basically this idea of like to really maximize someone's learning experience it's about finding that sweet spot where where they're at and how if you can craft an environment people can actually perform a little bit better and so what he called this is this zone of proximal development it's basically the idea is like if i engage you as students and i make everything say you're new writers and i expect you right away to be writing like your shakespeare or hemingway or dickens or uh, charles dickens it's like I'm going to fill you with anxiety. That's too hard of a challenge. But if I ask you to, you know, write like 10th graders or something, it's going to be like almost an insultingly easy challenge for people that are in their second or third year in university, and you're going to find it boring. So that was a weird way of explaining it. But basically this idea that there's a, a threat when you're creating a learning environment that if it's overly complex, it's anxiety provoking. But if it's underly complex, it's... Uh, boring basically and so finding that sweet spot in the middle is what Vykoski is calling this sweet spot this sweet spot distance right proximity it's like not too much this way not too much that way it's the right distance the proximity the zone of it's like the basically you hear in common speech just call it like a zone being in the zone and he's saying that being basically related to this idea of proximity, right? That if you ask the child to do something that's way too hard or way too easy, you're not engaging them in the most optimal learning environment, right? And we've kind of talked about this idea before, but basically he said, you got to think of it as kind of like a spectrum. So if the lower limit of a child ZBT or the zone of proximal development, if the lowest level of that is basically what they could do without any of your help. And then it's this idea of like, what if you were to create a perfect scenario for that child? 
and had somebody modeling the right behavior and in a way that was totally focused on the child and it was like the perfect learning setting that would be their upper limit so from that lower limit to the upper limit would be their zone of proximal development that's the zone the distance that's the proximal the proximal zone i know the language is like a tongue twister right but it just means finding that sweet spot that's the better that's the easier way of saying it so before explaining this slide i want to just real quick tag on something to that last slide uh just this idea that vykovsky's belief in the importance of social influences on a child's cognitive development is reflected in this idea of the zone of proximal development the zone of proximal development is vykovsky's term for the range of tasks that are too difficult for the child to master alone but can be learned with the guidance and assistance of adults or even more skilled children thus the lower limit of zbt or the zone of proximal development is the development or is the level of skill reached by the child if they were working independently and the upper limit is the level of additional responsibility a child could accept with the assistance of an able instructor the zpd zone of proximal development captures the child's cognitive skills that are in the process of maturing and can be accomplished only with the assistance of a more skilled person okay so what do you mean a more skilled person well that's linked to this idea of scaffolding so think about this if you're ever in a city and you're driving down and they're creating a new building and as they're making this building they're they're creating this kind of uh what you see on the screen there this like um steel temporary exostructure around it that allows them to build it up it's a temporary thing that's allowing the actual building to grow that's what the word scaffolding means closely linked with the idea of the zone of proximal development is the concept of scaffolding introduced earlier and we talked about that earlier in the course when we were talking about parent um infant interactions but this idea that scaffolding means changing the level of support because say you're making a skyscraper you don't build that scaffolding all the way up to the top height of the sky skyscraper when you're just working on the first floor you kind of keep building it as you're going up and that's why it's a useful metaphor for talking about creating a a learning structure for a child when a child's learning a new task the skilled person may use direct instruction as the child's competency is increasing less guidance is given one study found that scaffolding techniques that heightened engagement and that encouraged the direct exploration of the child and that could facilitate sense making or help the kid making sense of it such as some forms of guided play could help improve a 4 and 5 year old's child's acquisition of geometric knowledge so basically like they found that this scaffolding is basically really helpful in teaching math specifically like one study just was looking at the specific academic um development of math specifically not just kind of academics in general so that's pretty interesting cuz that's a huge component of school and one that a lot of people struggle with so i've talked about them a lot i don't know if i've shown this picture yet it's you know i think it just it helps understand who these people were and i've, I've made the point before that he was um he's a russian scientist and that there was there's like an really interesting um i've never read a really awesome book about it i've heard some interesting people talk about it but there it there is a lot of arms races going on during the cold war with uh the states in the ussr what we now call russia and part of that part of it was around nuclear weapons part of it was around getting to the moon part of it was well there's just so many the nukes and the moon were the big ones but also in development of all kinds of things related to science and psychology specifically because psychology had this huge connection with the war efforts and where you had big name psychologists involved in the state side most notably people like skinner um yeah it's just interesting to to, to look at how these super because when these people were at their peak it was you know these superpowers were staring at each other across well you know like they called it a cold war for a reason it was 
the closest uh, two superpowers, both with nuclear weapons. There's tense times. Right? I don't know how much this is. This is way off topic, but you know, you might want to watch sometime a movie called Twelve Days. That's about the Cuban Missile Crisis and when, and it kind of links to the Cold War. And it's an interesting look at how how JFK handled things. So anyway, so again, I'll get back to the slide. Uh, what Zykoski, but anyways, the reason I said that is because I was making this comment that this is kind of something that's under the waves that doesn't really get talked about in a lot of like university psych classes is this obvious connection to the military, right? And like, you're all s students that, I know you're not all psych students, but you're all students that obviously are taking this class and that are, are probably taking, I would assume, sorry, I don't know better, but I'd assume are taking lots of psych related classes but it's interesting to know that a lot of these people had side jobs so anyways what Vakoski's saying is that to uh, forgive me i hope you i hope you don't mind some of these like little mind um rants i go on here but Vakoski is basically trying to tell us that if we want to create a coaching or a learning or a teaching environment where people are going to achieve the highest levels possible we kind of need to do these four things first of all we need to understand where the child's at so if we're going to understand we have to establish this range this upper and, and lower limit and understand basically he's saying it has to be individualized to the specific child right so first it has to be assessed then the teaching has to be aimed we have to use that child's zone of proximal development we teach towards the upper limit we provide support we try to pull the child towards that upper limit of their zone of proximal development and as the child's getting smarter that zone's going to be a floating zone right Vukovsky also argued or, or suggested that there's a real value in having skilled peers involved also right so this would you see this even at a, at a local level maybe in schools with things like reading buddies and stuff and this idea that sometimes a really good way to teach kids to learn is to have a kid that's just a little bit more advanced than them modeling the behavior and kind of pulling along their development because you know sometimes having an adult try to teach them there there's too big of a gap there's too big of a zone of proximal development to use Vikoski's language there and then the more that you can place their learning within a context of what matters to them right so this is basically saying the more that you can make their learning seem meaningful and valuable and important and that it matters the more likely they are to and this is just kind of like saying if you can increase how much they're engaged and how much they're paying attention and how much they care that that affects everything so it's pretty interesting if you're interested in getting into teaching if you're interested in getting into coaching working with kids camps any kind of thing um, that has an instructional or a coaching or a facilitational component it's it's important to understand what Vukovsky's main idea was was that if you're really trying to optimize performance it has to be individualized and it needs to be well that that scaffolding metaphor is a useful way of looking at it Piaget and Bukowski's theory provided important ideas about how young children's thinking changes with age. More recently, the information processing approach has generated research that illuminates how a children's or how children's ability to process information changes throughout childhood. We'll focus now in this next piece on these kind of three areas. Okay, so what you're going to notice here is that I'm basically going to do a slide on each of these: attention. Um, well, more than one slide, but I'm going to do a segment, I should say, on each of these. Attention, memory, and then uh, executive function. Okay, so a child's ability to pay attention improves significantly during the preschool years. Toddlers wander around, shift attention from one activity to another, seem to spend little time focused on any one event. But by the time a child reaches middle childhood, their ability to cognitively maintain attention is greatly increased. And it's effective or it's important to kind of understand these in two levels so one of it is what's called executive attention so that actually means their ability to pay attention to kind of goals to detect 
and to compensate for errors, to monitor project uh, progress on tasks, to deal with novel or difficult circumstances. I know I think my picture might be covering a little bit. It just says difficult there. So there's two things. There's like basically their cognitive ability to pay attention and to focus and to um, well, just what it says there, kind of attention is the focusing of mental resources on specific information. There's that. That's kind of called a, a executive attention. And then sustained attention is their ability to maintain that over time, right? To, it just says they're focused, comma, extended engagement with a task. It's called like the vigilance of attention or, or how long they can stay task oriented before they're bored and wanting to do something else so basically it's just this point that attention is two things one is the cognitive ability to do it and the ability to stay doing it and not get bored immediately in addition to age-related changes in attention there's also a wide range of individual differences but it's interesting to know that preschool sustained attention has been found to be linked to greater likelihood of actually completing university 25 years later. That's kind of interesting point, right? So for this one, notice anything different about me? Oh, you noticed the hat? My wife hates this hat. This is my cut in the grass hat. You may have noticed it immediately. If you were looking at the slide while it switched, you probably noticed it immediately. Why? Because I don't usually wear a hat. All of a sudden, I'm wearing my grass cutting hat. That's salience. That's a difference. That was a visual change. Your brain is more likely to notice something because it's not like me changing to a different shirt that's also black and has a bit of yellow or orange or whatever on it. It's like that would have a that would be a low saliency change. So, I don't know, that was maybe a weird way, but I was just trying to explain what this word saliency means, how, how much it stands out, and that kids have a preference, as do everyone, but especially kids, when their uh, attention is developing, they have a preference towards salient things. Preschool children are likely to pay attention to stimuli that stands out. Or that is the word for something that stands out is that it's salient. Even when those stimulus are not relevant to solving the problem or performing the tasks they're working on. For example, if a flashy attractive clown presents the directions for solving a problem, preschool children are likely to pay more attention to the clown than to the words that the clown's actually saying. So if it's like, okay, now we're going to play a game and... The person that's going to tell you the directions for the game is right over there and then they turn and instead of it just being a regular person it's a clown and the clown's like well first we're going to do this and this and this i don't know i probably look silly doing that but they're like they're going to be like then you're like okay so what's the rules and the kids are like i don't know but did you see that clown it's like the clown almost overwhelmed the thing so i'll say that again if a flashy attractive crown clown presents directions to solving a problem preschool children are less likely to, or likely to pay more attention to the clown than to the directions. After the age of six or seven though, children tend more uh, attend or pay attention to more efficiently the dimensions of the tasks that are relevant, such as the directions for solving a problem. This change reflects a shift to cognitive control of attention. The kids are ba basically noticing that, not getting overwhelmed by it and still able to focus basically better as they're getting older. This change reflects a shift to cognitive control of attention so that children act less impulsively and reflect more. The other difference we see is related to planfulness or that when experimenters ask children to judge whether two complex pictures are the same, it's like some kind of task of like, here's two pictures, circle the differences or how they're different. They find that kids that are at a certain age that are younger basically just look at the two pictures and try to see if anything stands out and if not then they don't see it whereas the kids that are a little bit older kind of more meticulously they first they go through the tree and then they look at this tree and then they go through this and the level of complexity and how they approach the task is significantly different 
Uh, when experimenters ask children to judge whether two complex pictures are the same, preschool children tend to use a haphazard comparison strategy, not examining all the details before making a judgment. By comparison, elementary school children are less likely, or sorry, are more likely to systematically compare the details across the pictures one at a time. This ability of preschool children to control and sustain their attention is closely related to this idea called school readiness or how ready they're cognitively are for school, which is a variable that's highly related to a whole bunch of kind of academic positive things down the road. In this course, we've already talked about memory in different ways, and we're going to kind of talk about, I'm not going to go super deep into you know, defining the difference between short term and working in um, long term memory again. But I think I'm, we are going to talk about how it relates to childhood because it's actually quite interesting because a lot of this stuff has direct relevance to this, what we call cognitive development or this emerging brain. Um, and the first thing I want to talk about is short term memory. So in your notes, this is kind of a, a key, sorry, this is kind of a key idea that Cognitive growth and memory, you know, you're, you're getting into a, a tough question when you separate which, like how those things are related, because obviously so much of your cognitive growth is your brain remembering connections between things. Your memory is so intimately connected with who you are that this information retention over time is a central part or central process within what we call cognitive growth. So we have this short-term memory, we have this sensory memory, we engage the world, and you might have heard me say this again, but like it's like memory is interesting, but what's way more interesting than memory is why we forget so much, why we don't remember everything, why you don't know what the color of the shirt of the fourth last person you passed at the store was, and why you're constantly forgetting stuff. And, and how we seem to be attracted to things that we see as meaningful in our environment. And that we have this, what's called short-term sensory memory, where um, individuals retain information that they're exposed to, up to, you know, people argue a little bit, but the research tends to say within this range of about 30 seconds. And so if I give you a list of numbers, and you don't try to rehearse it, or you don't do anything... You know, if I'm like, okay, eight, seven, four, nine, six. Now, if if you just start thinking about other things and start reading, especially if you switch tasks, the chances that you're going to say that back, right, are almost zero. Like, for example, I made up the number myself, but just since I, I've been talking for like a minute since then, I, I wouldn't, I think I said a six and a seven and a two, or I don't remember even the order, right? So it's like, unless we're rehearsing it and repeating it we're we're forgetting things out of our short-term memory constantly now there are ways that we can learn to keep that in our memory more like things like rehearsing it like saying it over and over and over and over and over but the point i wanted to make here is those are all cogn those all require cognitive effort and work right so at a certain point if you're going to remember that list to do that you have to kind of use your conscious mind to apply attention and do that mental work of repeating it and going over it again and again and again what we see is that as kids get a bit older their whole cognitive processing the the whole speed of this whole situation improves and Part of that is linked to this, you know, myelination idea or myelination idea. There's no Z in it. Myelination idea that we've been talking about and, and that the neurons are getting this strengthening, this, this protective coating that's allowing the neurotransmissions to be faster. And with that actually, how you see that or what, how that, uh, I guess I don't need those. Sorry, I sometimes put those on to test how it sounded. Um, what you need that for, right, is to, or sorry, what I meant to say is how you see that play out in the kid's life is this improved processing speed. Right, so if you look at this chart, you see this 
major increase in digit retention. So digit means like, say I say like, uh, okay, I want you to remember five, six, eight, three, that's four digits, right? So we see that like a two year old can probably remember about two. If I ask my daughter, like, can you say six, five? She probably could. I don't know. She may even be able to do three, right? Like, but she's four, so actually you would be able to predict she could do three. By the time you're up to an adult, you can probably do about seven, which is famously why that's, you know, before area codes were such a huge thing for everybody, right? Back when I can remember when it was still the seven digits, you didn't have to put 519 or whatever it is in, in North Bay before the number, right? It's like the reason it was seven and why when people tell you their number, it's like, six nine eight five two four one it's like they're not gonna say they don't just rifle off all seven in a row we kind of chunk two right and that's that's another kind of memory related thing but we see that this chart's a pretty kind of clear example of uh, of how age re relates specifically to memory span so working memories another fascinating part of this whole memory system this idea that you know basically what we're experiencing right now is working memory a lot of our thinking occurs here it's where we make decisions and solve problems and comprehend written and spoken language the fact that you're understanding even what i'm saying and making sense of these utterances of sound from my vocal system is because you know what words mean and that's why i think that that picture there is kind of interesting right and it's it's making this idea that like yeah there's things from our environment that we're maybe learning and it's going through a working memory and becoming part of our long-term memory but it's also directionally the other way and our long-term memory is helping us make sense of our current engagement with our learning environment or our world you can just call it our world nurture Right. So it's this idea of like what's actually the way to think about that in a very specific, tangible way would be in relation to something like language. And that's what I kind of said before. Right. Like you're not going to be able to even talk if you can't use your memory to re inform your in the moment processing of the situation with the context of what the words you're using mean. And the thing that's so interesting is your brain does it at such a light speed rate that you're not even thinking, especially if you're fluent in a language. And, you know, very interestingly, that's basically what fluent means, that when you're fluent in a language, it's a level, it almost reaches a level of automaticness. So British cognitive psychologist Adam, or Alan Badley in 2013 defined working memory as a type of mental workbench where, so it's basically where you do your work. Right? what's a workbench it's where like a carpenter keeps all their or just a tradesman or whatever keeps all their tools and goes and does all their work where individuals manipulate and assemble information where they make decisions and solve problems and comprehend written and spoken language working memory is described as being a more active and powerful uh, or having an active powerful process in modifying information a more more active and, and powerful process than short-term memory working memory involves bringing information to mind so uh, think about that just sit back for a second you've heard comments like that before but to sit back and kind of just think deeply what does it mean to bring information to mind right and it's like it's it's informing your in the moment engagement with your reality at the deepest of levels working memory involves bringing information to mind and mentally working with or updating it as when you link one idea to another and then relate what you're reading now to something you read earlier working memory develops slowly even by eight years of age children can only hold up to about half of the amount of items in their memory as an adult can excuse me working memory is linked to many aspects of children develop child development for example children who have better working memory are more advanced with their comprehension of language with their math skills with problem solving skills than their town than their counterparts with 
more uh, struggles with working memory. That's not super shocking, right? That like the kids that score highest in working memory, the part of the your kind of consciousness that is applying attention and processing information that they would do better in school. You know, it. you can see how people make the comparison to like a processing speed of a computer here, right? Because you could not to not to compare people to computers too much, but you could easily make the point like obviously a computer with a stronger processor can process information faster than a computer with a slower processor. And, you know, while that's only a metaphorical way to talk about this, there's at least some explanatory power in or uh, use in looking at it that way. So then for long term memory. So this is the last one and just this idea that this is this and again it's like all these aspects it's like there's not really you can't really have a favorite it's like short-term memory is super interesting because it's I think the most interesting part about short-term memory is how you how selective it is how much it's not paying attention to some things and is paying attention to others working memory like everything but working memory is interesting that's basically who you are and what you experience is your working memory your consciousness largely lives there and then your your long-term memory it's like that's that's like your your mind database base that's like you know only partially accessible and infinitely complex this relatively permanent unlimited type of memory that increases with age during middle and late childhood it the people's ability to access long-term memory seems to improve across childhood as as the kid gets better with selective attention or being able to focus and and their short-term memory also starts to increase and their working memory seem to all be kind of linked with attention which makes sense right if 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 you needed your friend to to remember something or else you were going to be like in a bunch of trouble you would be really focused on the fact that they were paying attention when you told them it right the link between memory and paying attention is in some ways very obvious but but still interesting to note right that children kind of construct their memory from this developing knowledge so it's like they have knowledge about different things and they start to notice and or how things are organized and represented and how they interpret information children actively construct their memory they're creating this they're becoming more more or less expert and more in different things right they're starting to know what a think what these things are and they know what these toys are and they know what this is now and they're knowing what things are is because they're developing this long-term memory and also developing the ability to call upon it with their working memory to inform their in the moment engagement with the world you know sorry for saying that same sentence a whole bunch of times but long-term memory is so important in informing short-term memory i mean working memory and this is why things like alzheimer's are so devastating right because it interferes with that it interferes with the ability of people's long-term memory to inform their in the moment experience and when that gets interfered with it can be very confusing and disorienting and overwhelming for the person with alzheimer's which is something i want to get into more in the next course right when we talk more about developmental stuff later because we haven't even we're this course is, is very much about kids to kind of teens right and then we get into adults next time so in terms of helping kids uh develop their memory there are strategies for improving memory uh one thing that's really important to understand is like how engaged the kid is in the moment and how much how rich the learning environment is meaning like how much uh, they're able to kind of apply their understanding and explain their understanding and all that kind of stuff has a big effect on 
how that gets coded in their mind and how it gets remembered. So there's these are some sort of some recommendations for for interacting with kids around trying to help them get better with their memory. One way is to really focus on so I even do this with my own daughter. I'm starting this idea of like getting her to explain what she means all the time. Not like annoyingly, but when she makes some comment getting her to the more you can elaborate for example the more you can tell me about who Vukoski is and like if you even remember some of that stuff I said about the USSR American tension and how all that stuff is all creating what in memory research they would call memory pegs that helps you become more likely to you're basically building different um, you're adding complexity and layers and connection points to the memory that makes it more likely you're going to find it later. That if we can motivate children to remember material by understanding it more than just memorizing it. So, for example, if you understand who Freud was, and I have you say like, and I give you some kind of quote that's like a Skinner quote, and it's like very much about how to understand people, you just have to understand their behavior and their mental processing, you know, is, or I say something like that kind of totally is a non-Freud thing. And because you know who Freud is, you can kind of understand it. So I don't know why I struggled so much to explain that. But basically what I'm saying is you have more of an applied understanding than just basically what's called the root memorization. And that, that under, knowing why a question is or why an answer is the way it is, or being able to have that contextual understanding is just a deeper level of knowing. Repeating and varying the way that you, you present the information and linking it to other things. And then, you know, using language that's memory fostering. So for example, like helping them break down complex words and understand maybe why the words are they the way they are. For example, like today we're talking about Piaget and what pre-operational actually means. What does the operational part of that word mean? And when you understand what the word means, the likelihood that you'll remember that term increases. So there's different types of memory. So one thing that I wanted to talk about is this idea of Autobiogra autobiographical memory or basically the story of your lifestyle memory hey what did you do last weekend you tell me what you did on the weekend autobiographical memory now developing this sense of self is tied to this autobiographical memory so I want you to think about that point for a sec this has incredible relevance for adults too this idea that the, the ability of the child to see themselves as a psychological self and the ability for them to tell themselves a story about who that psychological self is are connected. So this, this is kind of interesting in talking about how memory gets represented in the brain and that there's this idea that's called fuzzy trace theory. So let me... So this is this idea that kids, well, it's, the, so think of what the gist is. It's like, say I give some long-winded speech and someone's like, okay, well, don't tell me the whole th rant Mike went on, but what was kind of like his main point? What was the gist of what he said? What was the central idea of the information that he presented? And this idea that kids tend to catch on to that gist idea. So let me just read this for a sec. This fuzzy trace, so just think of what that means. It's like instead of having like the memory saved as like a crystal clear like stored file, it's more like it's like fuzzy traces and that these fuzzy traces interact. Okay, so fuzzy trace theory states that memory is best understood by considering two types of memory representation. This idea of verbatim memory trace, like remembering word for word or spe very specifically, very 
crystal clear or this idea of the gist, kind of remembering the essence of it. Verbatim memory trace consists of the precise details of information, whereas gist refers to the central idea of the information. When gist is used, these fuzzy traces build up. So what they're saying is this, by focusing, the kids tend to focus more on the essence of what happened. That's why sometimes kids have trouble explaining exactly what they did at school that day. Young kids. When gist is used, these fuzzy traces build up. Although individuals of all ages extract the gist from their experience, young children tend to store and retrieve both that and these verbatim traces. So they'll, they're will they going to remember certain things that were said during the day, maybe to them or that they said or that their friends said, and then they're going to just kind of remember the gist of certain things. This is kind of the idea. Although individuals of all ages, oh, sorry, I already said that. At some point during the early elementary school years, children begin to use this gist more. So as they get older, they do it more and more and more. So it's, basically it's like as they're getting more cognitively complex, they're kind of like, say if it was note taking, they're not writing down word for word what the teacher's saying anymore. Now they're starting to focus on what the important parts are, what the gist is, right? And so this is, again, one of the most interesting things about memory is what, what we focus on and what we don't. This idea of the children in early elementary school beginning to use the gist more is, contrib is thought to contribute to this improved memory and improved re reasoning of older school age children. The argument is that these fuzzy traces are, are the, remembering the gist is less likely to be forgotten in the brain's pruning process than verbatim memories. That's the rationale for why gist memory might be a more advanced, even though it's a less photographic sort of type of memory. And then the last of these changes that I wanted to say is like, so we talked about um, attention. Oh yeah, sorry. I'm talking about it for like half an hour. Memory, attention, memory, and then the last one, executive control. So basically executive controls like those higher end um, tasks like working memory is actually included in that. Being able to be mentally flexible, being able to have some self-control and inhibition. So let me just throw this up here for your notes. And I'm just, I want to read read a little piece to you. Adele Diamond and Kathleen Lee in 2011 at the University of British Columbia highlighted the following dimensions of executive function that they conclude are the most important for four to 10 year olds or four to 11 year old children's cognitive development and school success. So basically for school age kids. All right. So basically they say, okay, these are the things that are, they're, they're higher end. So executive functions of their brain. These are the things that are, seem to be really important to school success. Basically, number one, that they can pay attention, that they can concentrate. It shouldn't be super surprising that the ability to pay attention and concentrate is a key variable related to school success, that they're able to effectively use their working memory and that they have flexibility in thought. Right, that the idea is that these are the most important areas of cognitive development in terms of what relates specifically to school success. So for self-control and inhibition, children need to develop self-control that will allow them to concentrate on and persist in learning different tasks that will help them inhibit their tendencies to repeat incorrect responses and will help them resist the impulses to do things that they'll regret later. In terms of working memory, children need an effective working memory to mentally work with the masses of information they will encounter as they go through their school and life and just the world in general. And then flexibility, children need to be flexible so that they can deal with changing situations and new strategies and new situational awareness, right? And that these are the three things that seem to be heavily linked to school performance, basically academics. So as the child's getting older and getting smarter, 
we see the development of these two aspects of thinking as important, right? These two, sorry, I should have said that, just these two important developments, the ability to think critically and the ability to think creatively. I love this picture. It's like the one mouse is yelling to his buddy, for God's sakes, think, why is he being so nice to you? The cat's just like leading the mouse away to eat. This ability to think critically is a, a, an emerging thing at this stage. Critical thinking involves thinking reflectively and productively and evaluating evidence. Deep understanding occurs when students are stimulated to rethink previously held ideas. People that advocate for critical thinking uh, v critique that schools spend too much time getting students to simply give correct answers in an imitative way, rather than encouraging them to expand their thinking by coming up with new ideas and rethinking earlier conclusions. They observe that too often teachers ask students to just recite or define or describe or state or list, rather than to analyze or infer or connect or synthesize or criticize or create or evaluate or think or rethink. Many students complete their assignments, do well on tasks, get good grades, yet they don't learn to think critically and deeply. They think more superficially, staying on the surface of their problems rather than stretching their mind and becoming more deeply engaged in meaningful thinking. Not my students. We're going to do a whole thing on critical thinking if you're in the next class. I think critical thinking is a, a desperate necessity. You know, it's like you have to... Well... It's, it's important for a child and it's important for an adult to be uh, aware of how you're processing the information that's entering your mind. And uh, especially if the information is intended to manipulate you. We'll get into critical thinking later. Critical thinking is core though. And what I'm saying today is just that here's where we're seeing the genesis of it, the emergence of it. So it, kind of similar to critical thinking, even though it's creative thinking, and critical thinking are quite different, but they're similar in the sense that they're emerging at this time period. We start to see the child be able to be more flexible in their thinking. That's another way you could say it. So if I made every, think about, so the words here that are important to understand are convergent and divergent so think about like two streams if you just look at my hands for a sec two streams that are coming forward and converging right whereas uh where you know everybody's saying the same thing whereas like divergent thinking is like the streams diverging into two which produces many different answers to the same question characterizes creativity so this idea is that there's kind of these two um, patterns of thinking, convergent and divergent. Let me just, this is the work of a guy named Gullfield, so I'm just going to read something here. Creative thinking is the ability to think in novel and unusual ways and to come up with unique solutions to problems. Thus, intelligence and creativity are not the same thing. The difference was recognized by J.P. Gullford in uh, 1967, who distinguished between convergent thinking which produces one correct answer and characterizes the kind of thinking that's required on conventional tests of intelligence and divergent thinking, which produces many different answers to the same question and characterizes creativity. Okay, so another point that I have here is like, it's important to recognize that kids will show more creativity in some areas than others. A kid might be like a really creative in drama class and a very and really struggle to be creative as like a writer. Those two things aren't necessarily connected, even though they're both creativity. So that's kind of another interesting thing. It's just like more nuanced than that. So metacognition is an interesting idea, right? So say if I was, it's thinking about thinking, knowing about knowing, cognition about cognition. You're like, where are you going with this mic? It's like if I asked you, do you feel ready for the next quiz? And you're like, well, I haven't studied enough yet. I don't feel ready. Well, what does you not feeling ready mean? At a certain point, that's you 
thinking about it's like you having you doing almost like a mental inventory on yourself you're thinking about thinking you're thinking about even that process of like i don't think my thinking is at a level yet where if i was to test it i would perform well on this test many studies classify this metacognitive or you know what i'm talking about here maybe is better termed meta memory or this knowledge about memory this includes general knowledge about memory such as um, the knowledge that say like a recognition test or a recall test would measure it also encompasses though knowledge about one's own memory such as the student's ability to monitor whether, monitor whether they've studied enough for a test conceptualization of metacognition consists of several dimensions of executive fun functioning planning self-regulation basically your ability to like self-monitor at that level is just representing another level of cognitive development so remember the whole kind of point of today's presentation is this cognitive development and these kind of what's cognitive development even mean things that are happening in the brain that weren't happening before so earlier i had made the point that well first of all let's maybe get this down so when we're talking about intelligence what what is a kind of term or a definition we can use as a as a working definition in this course this idea that it's basically the ability to solve problems adapt learn from experiences i mean it's the ability to process information at a certain level it's like what we're going to actually kind of look at over this next bit is that what we mean by intelligence is actually kind of hard to pin down and there's a lot of different opinions on what it is but let's start with this because this is definitely the most used and probably the most validated psychometric that exists in 19 but i think you'll find it interesting in how this comes right so this binet individual whose image is above me here you'll remember earlier i said that the intelligence or what we call an iq test came from this person named simon who piaget was working for and then this guy so binet and simon and simon In 1904, the French Ministry of Education asked psychologist Alfred Bennett to devise a method of identifying children who were unable to learn in school. School officials wanted to reduce the crowding by placing students who didn't benefit from a regular classroom teaching in a special school. Bennett and his students, uh, and his student Theophile Simon or Simon or whatever, I don't know if it's Simon or Simon. Uh, actually Bennett and it's the French ministry so it's probably Simone I've been saying Simon this whole time but it doesn't overly matter but this intelligence test anyways it's interesting to think that these are two people that were working together and that Piaget's work for them and his analysis of the wrong answers that came from their standardization of the test actually led to his cognitive development model that is like so core in developmental psych so it's kind of interesting just historically how these people interacted even though you wouldn't necessarily associate them even though you would talk about them both in like a psych course obviously right so anyways i don't know i just find that kind of stuff really interesting that these people actually like hung out and knew each other and all that so anyways the intelligence is focused on this idea of assessing it and it's a comp it's comparative by nature it's focused on the differences between people. Now, Bennett's test, basically, okay, so this is how, how to understand how to calculate an IQ score, and this is still what it is. So it's like, you basically take this test, and this test gave you a score that was called an MA, that represented a mental age. And then you would take your mental age and divide it by your actual age, your chronological age, which is just like, like for example, I'm 39. If you were to say, Mike, how old you are? I wouldn't be like mental age or like, it's like, I would just say 39, right? So say, uh, say I'd, I've never done this, but say I did the intelligence test and say I scored like a 39 as my mental age and my chronological age is 39. 
right? So I would take that and then times 100, right? So that would give me a score of, of 100, which oddly is basically exactly what the average is in Canada. I think it's, I looked it up in a, before this and I forget, but I think it was, it's like 100.4 is the Canadian average. So let me just say this to you a little bit better. Um, cause I got thrown off there about just the, the name there and how it's interesting that they're all connected. So the original test that was created by Binet consisted of 30 questions on topics ranging from just the ability to touch one's own ear to the ability to draw from memory to the ability to define abstract concepts. So this was being devised by the French school system as a way to like basically say we have too many kids in the schools we need to realize which ones need to be kind of funneled into whatever i guess um more special schools is all it said right but i'm sure that they're talking about either trade schools or military schools so anyway so he develops this concept of mental age where an individual's level of mental development is tested relative to others so basically, if you're like, what am I talking about? What's mental age? It's what's it's when you do the IQ test, you get a score. That score is the mental age, basically. Right. And then you take that score divided by your age and times 100. So I know the math there is if, if in case some of you are like me, where math's not your strong suit. Um, so a few years later, after Bennett had come along with this concept of mental age, and how to test it. Another person comes along named William Stern, and he took this idea and said, okay, what we can actually do is give someone this intelligence quotient, which is what you see there, which was intelligence quotient, and that just means score, what we call just like an intelligence score, which everybody that you know calls an IQ. So this guy Stern comes along and he says, he creates this equation, basically, that is mental age divided by, sorry, I've said this a ton of times now, but divided by chronological age times 100. So what that actually means is that if somebody's mental age is the same as a chronological age, then their IQ would be 100. If mental age is above chronological age, then IQ is more than 100. If mental age is below chronological age, it's less than 100. So I said that about a million times now, so you shouldn't get that wrong on the test, okay? Mental age divided by chronological age times 100. So then here I want to show this to... I'll just put this all up in case you wanted to write some of that down. So then sometimes you'll see... So the kind of the current version of this is called the Stanford Binet test. And I actually have um, in the PowerPoint that I'll provide for you a link to a free online version of it if you're interested. Now, I wouldn't like go do this test and, and value your self-worth based on your score here. The reality is, is like, you know, most of, well, the reality is the Canadian average is about 100. And, you know, as a group of university students, I would suggest that you, I would suspect you would score on the higher end of the bell curve, but it's like, the people that have the highest intelligence aren't necessarily, intelligence isn't necessarily always functional. So, um, again, this is where it's, well, basically what the Stanford Binet test is, it's not testing you on everything. It's like quite literally testing you on five things. So I just wanted to highlight this because I thought you might find this interesting. It's what they call, so it's basically five categories of things that it's testing. It's looking at something called fluid reasoning which is reasoning. So basically just your ability to, so fluid reasoning would be like, not just if you're good at explaining certain things, but you can kind of have an ability to apply a level of reasoning in a fluid way, like basically in a bunch of different situations, you have a kind of flexible, adaptable thinking. Your general knowledge, so there'd be questions in that, like they might just ask something very specific, like, I'm just going to make this up, but they might ask, who is the historical figure Cleopatra? And maybe you have to, like, to get that point, you have to maybe mention Egypt, you maybe have to mention that she was, like, 
some type of royalty or maybe you have to just kind of demonstrate that you know who that person is so there's a kind of common trivial knowledge piece so fluid reasoning knowledge quantitative reasoning basically like math stuff visual spatial puzzle kind of stuff and then working memory so like saying back words and stuff so the they basically break it into these five things the reason it's called the stanford the standard binet um test is because where they did what's called their norms was at stanford university so what norms means is like to say that this is average and this is below or above average first of all you have to test tons of people to figure out what average is and what a normal score on something is and that's what you see there is like a traditional bell curve where most people are going to score around 100 right and then some people are going to score on either side but as you get to the more extremes you get less and less people scoring that way and that's like what you see on the screen there's basically a perfect bell curve and you can see why they would call it that because it kind of looks like a bell so by administering the test to large numbers of people of different ages from preschool all the way through adulthood from different backgrounds the researchers found that the scores on the stanford Binet test approximate a normal distribution which means like most people score around 100 or whatever some people score on each side and then you know there's extremes on both ends that's what would be called a normal distribution so if you were to take everybody's scores and chart them you'd kind of expect that if you what normal distribution means is that once you find the average that there'll be people that differ from that average on both sides but as you get further away it, it kind of you know bells out that's a norm what's called a normal distribution we're talking statistics right now but a normal just i should have just said this a normal distribution is symmetrical with a majority of the scores falling in the middle of the possible range of scores and a few scores appearing towards the extreme now where the middle is is going to be dependent on the situation but the idea is that the average of scores it's going to be like that and then as you get away from that average it bells out i hope i explained that decently so i wanted to touch on uh this wechsler scale that's just like a another version of it this one's some people like this with kids because of how it breaks things into specific components or what they call index so an in, what an index would be is like instead of just having one test of something and being like well this is a score on this maybe they test their ability to do a spatial task a bunch of ways and then they their score on all that the fact that there's like a bunch of tests that's like an index an index would be like your score on a group of tasks instead of just one so this idea that why this is kind of one that some people like to use is because it's not just one test there's like subscales so those subscales are those kind of broken down things uh, indexes i've been talking about so for example it's when you've completed this you would get a score overall but then you would also get a score on verbal memory or verbal comprehension on working memory on processing speed right so it's the difference is kind of in format and also in, in emphasis. I thought you'd find this piece interesting. So this is Robert Sternberg. We'll come. We'll touch on a few times. He's a, he's he's interesting because I don't know. He touches in on this course at different points, but like his theoretical contribution to early childhood developmental psychology is interesting because it's not. The reason I say that is because I actually kind of just had that thought because he's somebody that I've noticed I've been touching on at different places when I was when I've been giving examples. Um, yeah, he. Sorry, I'm doing this in the basement. It's like 12 at night and it seemed like a raccoon or something just slammed right into the window right there. Anyways, sorry. Maybe I'll leave that in because that's kind of cool. Whatever that sound was. Anyways. 
spooky uh, nighttime lecture. Okay. So anyways, so Sternberg. Sorry, I got all lost on that idea of like, but it's interesting. This guy keeps coming up. Robert Sternberg had this idea of a triactic theory. So a three point theory of intelligence. I'll put that up for your note taking. So he basically said, we have to, we should understand this more like styles. And it's like, there's what we can call analytic intelligence. Basically, um, if you're, stu if you're measuring someone's analytic intelligence, you're analyze, you're measuring their ability to analyze and judge and evaluate and compare and contrast a lot of the kind of things we do in school. But he argued that there's also these things called creative and practical intelligence that are important. So Sternberg developed this triactic theory of intelligence, which states that intelligence comes in three forms, analytic intelligence, which refers to the, the ability to analyze, judge, evaluate, and contrast, creative, and practical intelligence. Sternberg says that children with different triactic patterns, quote unquote, look different in school. So look different, obviously not physically, but in how they perform. <clears throat> Students with high analytic abilities tend to be favored in a conventional school setting. They often tend to do well under direct instruction in which the teacher lectures and gives students subjective tests. They often are considered to be smart students who get good grades, do well on traditional tests of intelligence, later get administered to or admitted to competitive university programs. In contrast, children who are high in creative intelligence are often not in the top rung of their class. Many teachers have specific expectations of how assignments should be done and creative and creative Intelligent students may not conform to those expectations. Instead of giving the answers that are being sought by the teacher, they may give more unique answers for which they may not get full marks. No teacher is really wanting to purposely discourage creativity, but Sternberg stresses that too often teachers have a desire to increase the student's knowledge with this kind of byproduct of suppressing their creative thinking. Like children who are high in creative intelligence, children who are high in practical intelligence often don't relate well to the demands of school. However, however, many of these children actually do very well when they're outside of the classroom. Because a lot of these kids have really good, highly developed social skills, really good common sense. As adults, a lot of these people might become successful managers or entrepreneurs or politicians, despite maybe not having done great in high school. They might have the, the kind of practical ability to get things done or to, you know, be successful, maybe like in a small business or something like that. So another way of looking at this, and I'm just going to throw this all up here so you can, uh, if, you're, if you're putting this in your notes. So there's eight. So just because I know my picture is covering the eighth one a little bit. It says observe nature's or nature patterns understand natural slash human world. So the words that are covered there are just human world. Okay, so anyways, so uh, Howard Gardner in 2002 suggested that there's eight types of intelligence or what he called the frames of mind. And you'll hear this a lot. Um, I actually, it was interesting for me to notice this in this textbook because in the other developmental courses I've taught, I, I never used this idea of Howard Gardner, but I used this idea of Howard Gardner and the eight frames of intelligence in a different class, the student success class I teach at Conestoga. So it's just interesting, like, I didn't really make the connection that obviously it also, also fits here, but I was already kind of using this idea of like, understanding intelligence of having uh, verbal and mathematical and spatial and body kinesthetic and I can kind of actually maybe say a little bit more, but these dimensions, right? So like there's people that have in different levels of intent. We could give people scores on all this. Some people have more of a, a verbal intelligence. Maybe they're really good at talking and communicating or, or even just understanding things in this verbal arena. Some people have, you know, different levels of intelligence around math or around spatial intelligence. Like for example, my wife's much better at doing puzzles or directions or stuff like that, like her spatial intelligence would score higher than mine. Body kinetic means like some people are just more athletic and more kind of naturally gifted in sports. And then fit, some people are more clumsy is kind of the other side of it. So it's like people are just 
more adept, I guess, is the word on the slide, meaning just like more capable, basically, or more more applied intelligence. You could say these. Oh, some of these are kind of applied intelligence. People have different intelligence and in things like musical ability and naturalistic ability. Like naturalistic ability meaning like, you know, one of my brother's best friends, Tony, who's a, a good buddy of mine too, is like a biologist, right? So like, when we go to his cottage, sometimes uh, it's like he can tell you every different type of beetle and it's like going into doing like some hike in the woods with him is like a totally different thing because his understanding of that natural world is like again like a different type of intelligence and then interpersonal and intrapersonal i skipped those because i wanted to say those last so interpersonal means like people are different in their kind of emotional intelligence or or situational intelligence or organizational intelligence i don't know if at nipissing they teach classes in organizational psychology um, if there is, those classes are sometimes a little boring, but the content in organizational psych is very relevant, I think, or something that you might find interesting. I'd maybe recommend taking a class like that at some point. But that'd be what interpersonal would be about, interpersonal between people. And then intrapersonal is like understanding yourself. And people are different at how much they're able to understand themselves. And some of that is like, to give you a real practical thing it's like when you get emotional are you able to calm yourself down and people are different at their ability to do that so that's Gardner's idea that <clears throat> maybe a more accurate way to view it is you know at a certain point intelligence isn't just being able to do patterns and answer trivia and do math questions some people that would score poorly on that actually still have incredible tele intelligence that isn't just kind of captured that way now just saying that though just because there's these other forms of intelligence doesn't mean that the iq test actually isn't an incredible predictor of all kinds of things if you knew nothing about someone and you only knew one piece of information and you had to use that information to determine who you thought would write better papers or like iq is still a, a very relevant predictive variable it's as relevant as i made the point earlier probably any other psychometric so but it's measuring a very specific thing it's actually like i said before it's measuring five very specific things it's not measuring all these other aspects of human applied intelligences right or whatever you know it's it's a challenge to the to the traditional theory of what iq is or what intelligence is and it's it's not necessarily even a challenge to it it's an expansion of it and an addition of of different dimensions but the reason i'm being a little bit long on this slide is because i'm trying to make the point that just because it's expanding and saying there's other aspects doesn't diminish the what what an iq test is right it's still it, it's still an accurate measurement on how people will likely perform in very kind of traditional academic settings now it has very little to say on how people will perform in maybe non-traditional academic settings which is the point of like uh you know gardner's work okay next slide you guys are like next slide already okay we're almost there we're getting there i know we're closing it on two hours this presentation is probably going to be a bit over two hours so I, I i'm actually interested in if any of you have a moment and want to reach out to me i'd be interested in how much and i know that you're some of you are coming from different programs and stuff like that but how much you've learned about like specifically what learning disabilities are i know that like the general public awareness of disabilities has expanded a lot i can remember back when i did my bachelor of social work way back in you know the stone age no back in i think i i started university in 2000 2000 eh? man i'm getting old i'm 40 this year but I graduated uh, my my uh, social work 
BSW, I think, and then I guess 2004. And when I was doing my back, my placement with that program, I was working in the um, accessibility office at the University of Waterloo, teaching, uh, working mainly with people with visual issues around um, teaching them some of the software and stuff at that time, which was like, if you've heard of like Kurzweil and Dragon Speak, that or natural speak, that's what, like what it was at that time. But so in anyways, the point I was making is I'd be interested in knowing if if you're taking like specific classes related to this stuff or if you're interested and in how much you know about it um especially when we get into like some specific things on the next slide like things like dyslexia and autism and um adhd okay so but before i get into those i want to make a couple important points and number one is that learning disabilities aren't intelligence issues they're not people with learning disabilities aren't just it's not about how smart they are in fact people with learning disabilities tend to have above average intelligence and oftentimes that's w why it's an issue right that there's some issue in the processing where they're not performing to their potential their intelligence related potential right and so a lot of times when people have a learning disability it's related to oftentimes one or several academic areas oftentimes related to processing information or attention or a lot of these kind of applied working memory things and then the other thing is that it's it's an issue that's not attributable by something else it's not some other diagnosable thing so i kind of mentioned this before but in and again i know these are like really broad sweeping generalizations but i'm trying to still do this very respectfully even though i'm talking not highly specifically yet but that in general a lot of learning disabilities are around these things like listening and concentrating and speaking and thinking right which are really all around information processing all right so it's interesting so now let's look at a couple at some um specific things i want to i'm going to kind of talk about those three things i already mentioned um autism dyslexia and adhd they're all very um well they're differing degrees of commonness with these things but these are all relatively common things um especially adhd and and autism but i mean dyslexia so these are so basically what i was going to say is these are all things that i find very interesting i think i want to just be clear here that in this presentation and how it relates to the specific course in the specific slide i'm basically doing like one slide on this um i find it kind of hard to touch on well autism spectrum disorder and uh, ADHD is so those are such huge topics it's hard to just touch on but I'm going to try to do that and then that's why I was kind of wondering how much if you're learning about this in other areas because I don't want to just repeat things but maybe in the next course we could talk a little bit more about this because I think this is an area where I've had a lot of um experience especially over the last kind of decade and i've kind of seen how things have changed in this area in terms of supporting students and stuff like that but also just i have a real belief in this idea of especially with certain kinds of technology like the most important thing to understand about learning disabilities is that first point i said that most people that have diagnosed learning disabilities are above average intelligence so you know I don't know to which of you that's important to hear, but that's an important thing to hear. So now let me just go for a sec here where dyslexia. So dyslexia is very interesting because it's highly related to the visual system and it's related to um, text usually and understanding basically related to like reading and spelling. Now, Once again, I'm going to just kind of 
touch on autism and do so understanding this is a massive topic and we could do whole courses and you might some of you very well may be doing entire courses related to autism and depending on what field you're doing that's completely appropriate right that's that is appropriate is what i said right so so let me just do this for a sec though because i think uh or what i wanted to say was that asd or autism spectrum disorder has a range so for example there can be people that are almost completely immobilized and have a very difficult time having almost any kind of functional um, engagement with society in a continual maintained way but then there's also people that have what we would call Asperger's that are highly functional for example when I was and he would be cool with me saying this because he's a close friend but now that when uh, I was going through university for years for like 10 years I was like involved in a place called extended family which is like kind of like big brothers I had a little brother kind of but it was through this other place and the guy that Jeremy who's a friend of mine now anyways like we've continued our relationship but for years from the time he was about six, 16 to maybe like 24 or something uh I was kind of like a big brother to him and the reason I'm talking about that is because I wanted to give an example of his cognitive situation. So he, for example, and again, I think he would, not I think, I know he would let me share. I've, I've talked about him in classes at Conestoga tons of times and he knows that. Um, but anyways, so I just don't want you to worry about his privacy. He'd be cool with it. He, uh, okay, you're like, okay, Mike, we get it, we get it, we get it. Um, I've been, I was at his wedding. We're tight. So anyways, but the point I wanted to make and to justify this whole ramble is when we say, for example, we'd be driving down the road because what I would do is like with Big Brothers or whatever, or extended families, it was called. What I would do is I would pick them up and we'd like maybe go for lunch or like, you know, go play uh, basketball for a bit or whatever, have like some social interaction. And... Uh, say we're driving down the road he'd be able, and we're passing farms and stuff because uh i lived out in the country and so did he and so anyways so you're passing like farms and stuff like that and he could tell you every type of tractor he could tell you like about the motors he'd tell you about all the cars we passed but if we went into the store and went to buy a bag of chips the interaction with the person selling the bag of chips would have been too much for him. He, that was, you know, at first he, he's gotten like the growth of this kid has been inspirational. He's married and has a job and lives on his own with his wife. Well, not his own, but he lives with his wife. Like, so again, like I have, uh, especially in a lot of the fields you're getting into it's like there's special challenges but there's also especially with some of this stuff um and and some learning disabilities especially when we talk about things like adhd some of the technologies that exist that can be helpful things like dragon natural reader like the thing i referenced earlier um but i'm gonna get to adhd in a second so autism spectrum disorder uh kind of ranges this is the point i was making on that long ramble was kind of ranges from more severe to uh milder disorder called asperger syndrome asds is uh people are is characterized by problems with social interaction problems with verbal and nonverbal communication repetitive behaviors you probably know most of this children with these disorders may have atypical responses to stimulus right so that's a common um really known, commonly known thing that oftentimes kids that are autistic can get overstimulated but again i have like starred here that i wanted to make sure to say that each individual condition is unique because of the degree of the so to, unique both in how it that it's experienced by the person and how much that experience interferes with their life 
because people are in different family settings, different social situations, different cultures, different all kinds of things. So even if people have the exact same level of, um, it affects them the exact same amount, they're in different worlds. So, right, somebody might have parents that are really supportive and buying them a new computer that helps them, or and someone else might not have those. And so the effect can be different, even though the uh, experience is the cause of is the same or whatever. You know what I mean. Okay, next slide. So there's different classifications. I, I kind of skipped that part on the last slide. I meant to mention that there's different, um, kind of three different classifications of ADHD. Um, people kind of usually get put into, if, if they're diagnosed with it, either as ADHD predominantly inattention. So the person's main issue is um, problems with attention. You can, it can also be predominantly hyperactivity that their main issue is the hyperactivity or that it's both inattention and hyperactivity, so that both those are the problem. So it's kind of like um, people tend to get one of those three, and the majority of children get actually the third one of those. But I wanted to show this, because I thought you'd find this interesting. So this is looking at brain scans. So again here, the pink or the beige or whatever that is, it shows where the delay in the area of the brain is greater than two years. And then the blue is where it's between, uh, it's less than two years. The development of brain image techniques is leading to a better understanding of ADHD. One study revealed that peak thickness of the cerebral cortex occurred three years later, so at 10 and a half years on average, in children with ADHD than in children with, without ADHD, where it peaked at about seven and a half years. That's by a from research by a psychologist named Shaw from 2007. The delay was more prominent in the prefrontal regions of the brain. So you see there in pink or, or like, you know, orangey pink or whatever. In the prefrontal regions of the brain that are especially important in attention and planning. So think about that. So there's these delays in these prefrontal cortex areas that are associated with paying attention and planning which are things that people with ADHD struggle with so much. So that's like the brain scan here is, is so interesting. <laughs> Another study found delayed in the development of the brain's frontal lobe among children with ADHD was likely due to delayed or decreased myelinization, right? Myelinizing, myelinine, <laughs> myelination. Sorry, it's like I've said that word so many times now that I'm like tripping myself on it. I keep wanting to add a Z in it. Researchers are also exploring the roles that various neurotransmitters such as serotonin and dopamine might play in ADHD. And it's also been found that ADHD seems to have a genetic link uh, very specifically to the dopamine transmitter, uh, the dopamine transporter gene DAT1. So that's kind of technical, but the tr if you were to say like, what do I mean that it has a genetic component, uh, the dopamine transporter gene capital D, capital A, capital T, one is like very specifically the gene that we're talking about. That seems to be decreased in, a, that seems to be, that gene seems to be involved in a decrease in the cortical thickness of the prefrontal cortex in children with ADHD. Right, so what we, oh wait, sorry. I don't mean you, you don't have to wait. I just mean I have another piece I want to say. The delays in the brain development just described are in the areas that are linked to executive function like we've been talking about today, like paying attention, working memory, um, ability to plan, all that kind of stuff. An increased focus on the interest, uh, an increased focus of interest in the study of children with ADHD is in their difficulty with tasks involving executive functions, such as behavioral inhibition, so like impulse control basically, working memory, executive planning. Researchers have also uh, found deficits in, okay, so sorry, researchers have also found with kids with ADHD deficits in theory of mind. Children diagnosed with ADHD have 
statistical increased likelihoods of school dropout, adolescent pregnancy, substance use, antisocial behavior. Now, the, the reasons for all that and the complexity of all that is, like I said, we could do whole classes on autism and ADHD. There, there's, there's, it's, there's just so many things to be said. But uh, f due to the focus of this specific presentation, I need to move on. But before I move on, darn, that segue would have been better if I for if I didn't forget that I had one last slide on this topic, but no, I, I do want to touch on this because I think um, in addition to potential medical or behavioral or like therapeutic interventions, um, one thing I wanted to mention around ADHD and especially if it's like a, your own kid and you were to just ask me as a friend, I really think that there's a role for traditional martial arts in helping kids with ADHD. Um, now, I should say that that's where all my research has been in. My master's thesis at University of Waterloo was on martial arts. You can, if you're ever interested, you could Google it. It's called Martial Mind. And then my uh, PhD thesis is called uh, Kung Fu's Inside the Body. And it's, it's uh, my PhD thesis is also about martial arts. And it's looking at these as actual... Uh, my PhD is looking at it a little bit more as, as kind of a therapeutic rec for people going through like cancer treatments and stuff like that, not necessarily as an intervention for people with ADHD, but that research exists, exists, and uh, is fascinating. And I think a physical training philosophical system would be my recommendation. Now, so that's kind of like the exercise and also touches on the mindfulness piece. And then neurofeedback is this idea of um, training individuals to become more aware of their physiological responses, right? More aware of when maybe having them wearing like a, another thing, way that you used to hear people call this is biofeedback. So maybe they're wearing like a heart monitor that measures their pulse. And they, you start to get them to notice when they're starting to get upset. So maybe you have a heart monitor that actually has like a beep on it. And that it beeps when they're upset. And they start to learn that they can, when they calm themselves down with their breathing, it actually changes this. And it's like just a way of what, what a lot of this stuff is, is to kind of show our, ourselves how we have that connection. To become aware of how to control that physicalness so that that physicalness doesn't control our thinking, right? So let me just read this kind of, this is kind of just a real concise definition of neurofeedback. Neurofeedback trains individuals to become more aware of their physiological, physical responses so they can attain better control over their brain's prefrontal cortex where executive control primarily occurs. Toddlers move rather quickly from producing two-word utterances to creating three, four, five-word combinations. Between the ages of two and three, they begin to, the transition from saying simple sentences that express a single proposition to saying complex sentences. To understand this, we were, we're going to talk about these, oh, I didn't put it up yet, sorry, these two ideas. Phonology and morphology. Phonology, right? So a phonology refers to the sounds of the language. So this includes the sounds, how they're used, how they're combined. During the preschool years, most children gradually become more sensitive to the sounds of spoken words and inc incredibly capable of producing all the sounds of their own language. By their third birthday, they can produce all the value of the vowels and most of the consonant sounds. So by the time a kid's three, most kids can produce all the vowel sounds, most of the consonant sounds. So the P being P and H being H and PH being like P. Again, I'm not going to keep doing that. I probably look silly doing that. But the that's like the actual building blocks of the sound. Now, morphology, you might not be able to see that because of how my picture is, but it's like this is one of, um, 
Sorry, I was just looking for the guy's name. Oh, yeah, Gene Burko. This is one of the tests, right? So you show this to kids and it says, this is a wug. Now, there's another one. There's two of them. There's two. And you kind of set the kid up like that, like for them to answer. And then what most kids will say is, there's two wugs. Now, what just happened there? That's interesting. Wugs is a made up word. In Burko's study, young children were much better than chance. What makes Burko's studies impressive is that these words are made up for the experiment. Thus, children weren't basing it on having heard the word before, but they were able to instantly make the word plural or change tense in different experiments, even for words they had never seen, showing that they're applying some kind of a rule, right? That they, they know that like, okay, so... If it's two things, you put an S on the end. And sometimes you see this evidence in how they make mistakes. So I'll read this. <clears throat> By the time children move beyond two word utterances, they just they start to demonstrate a knowledge of morphology rules. So think of what morph means, right? To transform. How to transform something from single to plural, maybe in this scenario. Morphology refers to the units of meaning involved in a word's formation. Children begin to use the plural and possessive forms of nouns, such as dog and dogs. They, they, so that has dogs as like D-O-G-S and then D-O-G apostrophe S and that those are different, right? They put appropriate endings on verbs. They start to use, right, kids get better and, and kids make this mistake a lot when they're young. They'll say like on or in and then they'll, they'll miss that up like you know, that, that, that the thing is on that or that it's in it, they'll make that kind of a mistake. But then this is what I was going to say before is sometimes where you see this is where a kid would say, okay, you have a foot. So what are both of, what are your two feet or what are your, you have one foot. So then would you have two foots, right? In English, we don't say foots, but morphologically, it would have made sense if we did. So we see kids often make that mistake or they'd say, um, what's the other one I had? That's a good one. Oh yeah. Instead of saying they went somewhere, they goaded there, right? Because in English, we often put ED on the end when it's past tense, right? So to say that you, you went to the store, you, you, you go there meant that you did it already. Like, so again, that's the wrong way to say that word, but morphologically, it shows that they're applying a rule, even though they might be doing it in a way that then makes them, you know, wrongly use the term. But the, the more important point is they're starting to use rules. So then let's just keep going with this for a bit, right? So in addition to the last slide, if we're talking about how this language is developing, there's also... Uh, syntax. So syntax is, so preschool children learn to apply rules of syntax, how words are supposed to be combined, right? So how we actually like kind of construct sentences or phrases. Children begin showing an increasing growing mastery of the complex rules for how they should order words. So literally how they kind of like it's not just the sounds. It's not just how they do the endings. Now it's like starting to say sentences and how you're supposed to the, like order the words in the sentence and all that kind of stuff is the syntax. Syntax. Then the semantics means like, okay, well, what do the actual words mean? So semantics means the meaning, the aspect of language that refers to the actual meaning of words. So in, uh, as the children gains, make gains in semantics, the as, which is the aspect of language that refers to the meaning of words and sentences, that this, uh, they start to get better at this in early childhood. Once, this is the point I wanted to make, I kind of stumbled because I read ahead too much there, but the point is why semantics matters or why this idea of all of a sudden now the children are starting to not just kind of parrot back language, but kind of 
speak from a place of deeper understanding and we find that as soon as they start to do that they, there's this massive increase in vocabulary okay the some experts have concluded that between 18 months of a uh, year, so basically a year and a half and six years of age young children learn on average about one new word every waking hour by the time they enter grade one it's estimated that the average child knows about 14,000 words so again so they're starting to know how to make the sounds they're starting to know how to change sounds in scenarios morphology they're starting to learn how to order sentences they're at sentences and phrases and stuff like that they're starting to learn semantics what words actually mean they're starting to learn the pragmatics which is like in what situation does it make sense to say something right if, if somebody's like uh what's the classic thing like hey how's it going and you're like or no Or if they're like, you know, you, you make that classic, like, uh, good and you, and it's like, that's not the question they asked. I don't know why I'm brain freezing on that, but it's like, you said something that's okay, but it wasn't appropriate in the situation. It's like, you've all, you all have probably a friend that like, just makes awkward, just will make a joke when it's like an awkward time or something like that. It's like, part of language development is learning when to use the language. I'm going to be mad when I watch this later that I couldn't think of that in the moment, but, um, again it's like this the situational awareness and contextual relevancy is what prag uh pragmatic means that it actually makes sense that prag pragmatic in a more general sense means that like you're doing things because it makes sense to be doing them so in terms of language development it means that you're actually using a word in a functional way right so if you go really deep with what pragmatism, pragmatism comes from William James, who was a functionalist, right? He, he, remember I made the point before that if you called Freud the European father of psychology, you'd have to call William James the American. A very interesting person wrote the most interesting probably book looking at the connection between spirituality and psychology called the varieties of religious experience that if you're if you're still watching that two and a half hours in you should add to your reading list because it's a good it's a good one classic so i just want to hit you with these six points because i think this is interesting right because it's like what are so these are like what would psychology teach is like six key principles of helping kids develop vocabulary and this is important because a lot of you are obviously wanting to work with kids that kids of this is sort of self-evident that kids learn the words that they hear the most often they learn more words about things that interest them it's why they know so many they can talk forever about the video games they like and stuff like that because they're intrinsically motivated to learn that children learn words best when they're in these responsive interactive content what contexts or environments again why the video game thing would make sense children learn words best in contexts that are meaningful so the more that they care about a situation the more that and the more that the language learning that language is functional so if you're like hey kids we're gonna play this new game and every time you know the the new password to you know because like my daughter and her friends like it's like it's all like there she's at that age where she like the there's like a password it's like you have to say evie's the coolest and then i can like go into her room to give her her snack or something it's like when you're in that scenario and they're motivated i don't know i kind of got rambly with that example but this idea that when they're motivated say you're playing a game and they're motivated to learn that that motivation and that meaningfulness like literally affects memory that children learn words best when they're giving clear information about what a word means and it's not vague and confusing that children learn words best when the when grammar and vocabulary are considered so when they're hearing it presented correctly so it's interesting it's like there are basically it's saying like the way they're all these are saying the same thing in a way just different nuanced aspects of it the way that 
the language is presented to the kid affects how the kid then internalizes it and can then produce it back. So, okay, so I want to just, uh, one last thing about this. So vocabulary, so this idea that the kids are continually developing this, their range of words, their ability to use it at a high level with through grammar, and then this idea of metalinguist, uh, metalinguistic awareness. So the process of categorizing becomes easier as the children increase their vocabulary. Children vocabulary increases from an average of about 14,000 words at the age of six to about 40,000 words by 11. These advances in vocabulary and grammar during the elementary school years are accompanied by a development of what's called metalinguistic awareness, that word at the top there, which is knowledge about language. Metalinguistic awareness allows a child to think about their language, understand what words are, or even define them. It improves considerably during the elementary school years. Defining words becomes a regular part of classroom discourses, and children increasingly, uh, and children increase their knowledge of syntax as they study and talk about the components of se uh, sentences such as subjects and verbs. Right. So this is kind of like saying like getting kids to like break down words, and it's like all linked to things like reading and writing and these things that are coming later. On that last slide, I kind of ended with a reference of that it's setting up like reading and writing later. So I just want to talk a little bit and I have a, a written piece from this is from the textbook um, that I want to read that is just going to kind of touch on this idea, right? Because there's kind of like some de debate and the textbook kind of presents both sides and then kind of comes in pretty heavy on the one side. And uh, I would agree. So. There's this idea of like, what do you, should you just expose kids to like basically whole language approach? So just to reading in general and kind of let their brains catch now within reason, right? Like obviously you're still going to aim it at their level or do you, or do you take more of a traditional phonics approach, um, focusing on understanding the sounds and the building blocks of language. Now, just a spoiler alert. What the research would suggest is focus on the phonics, but also expose them to the whole language, right? So it's not one or the other. It's like, you know, probably a healthy diet of phonics and then also expose them to a little bit more free form. But let me read this. Before learning to read, children learn to use language to talk about the things that are not present. They learn what a word is and they learn how to recognize sounds and talk about them. Children who begin elementary school with a robust vocabulary have an advantage when it comes to reading. So now I'm going to talk about these two different approaches. The whole language approach stresses that reading instruction should parallel a child's natural learning language. In some whole learning classes, uh, beginning readers are taught to recognize whole words and even entire sentences and to use the context of what they're reading to guess at what the word would mean. Reading materials that support whole languages approach are whole and meaningful that is the child are given the, the children are given meaningful material in complete form such as stories or poems so that they learn to understand a language's communicative function reading is connected with listening and with writing now there's definitely something to be said for that like in especially depending on an age appropriate. As a kid gets older, that kind of approach makes more and more sense. But um, the traditional phonics are, you know, you maybe had your parents when you were little tell you to sound it out, sound it out, and use your ability to sound out the word to help you spell it. That's phonics. In contrast, the phonics approach emphasizes that reading instructions should, taste, should teach basic rules for translating written syllables into sounds. Early phonics centered reading instruction should involve simplified material. Only after children have learned correspondent rules or the corresponding rules that relate to spoken phenomes to the alphabet letters that are used to represent them should they be given more complex reading materials such as anything like a book or a poem. Research suggests that children can benefit from both approaches, but instruction in phonics needs to be emphasized. 
an increased number of experts in the field of reading now conclude that direct instruction in phonics is a key aspect to successfully learning to read at a high level. Yeah, I should say this too. Beyond the Phoenix, I mean the Phoenix, beyond the phonics slash whole language issue in learning to read, becoming a good reader also includes learning to read fluently. Right, so what does reading fluently mean? It means this idea of automatic again, that when you look at the words, you know what it means immediately without conscious effort. You're, you're filling in that meaning gap automatically, fluently. Beyond the, uh, oh yeah, sorry, so this fluently idea. Many beginning or poor readers do not recognize words automatically. Their processing capacity therefore gets consumed by the demands of word recognition. So they have less comprehension of grouping words or phrases or sentences. As their processing of words though becomes more automatic, it's said that their reading becomes more fluent. So that's kind of interesting. All right, you've been listening to this for like two and a half hours. I'm going to do some rapid fire last few just chapter summary. Thanks for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, I'm just going to, you know, burn through. I think I have 11 or 12 key points. As children grow, this is kind of a review. As children grow, they lose that top heavy appearance. Individual differences in growth are influenced by, you know, both where the genetic origin of the of the um, child and the nutrition that they're exposed to so environmental influences and nutritional influences brain development includes myelination synaptic pruning or, or cutting away the connections that aren't being used and this increase of more localized activity certain parts are developing at different rates development in the prefrontal cortex is especially critical for planning and other aspects of executive function there can be individual differences in brain development related to things like parental quality and exposure to things like poverty. Gross and fine motor skills improve dramatically during childhood. Keep going here. Exercise and play are essential for optimal physical, cognitive, and social development for children. According to Piaget in the pre-operational, so remember before they can play around with ideas. Pre-operational stage, children cannot yet perform these mental cognitive operations. Pre-operational children can be characterized by egocentrism, animism, uh, and a lack of understanding of conservation. We looked at those three kind of examples. Uh, the latter caused by centration and a, a lack of reversibility or not being able to understand what would happen if you just poured it back in the other glass. That would be reversibility. By age seven, children enter the concrete operational stage, they start to be able to answer that conversion problem, right? Because their operations start to become more concrete. They're not pre-operational. Vygotsky's idea represents this idea that of social constructivism, that we're const the child's constructing their social world, that in relation to that, if you're trying to help them in that process, you have to understand how to engage them correctly. And doing that is related to this idea of the zone of proximal development and how it relates to creating a uh, learning scaffolding. This idea that information processing theory focus on how attention and executive function and memory change across, ad across childhood and that increasing increases in knowledge and the use of strategy contributes to these imp improved levels of performance across childhood. Okay, two more slides. Number nine, that cognitive development has implications for daily life. It, it's related to things like autobiographical memory. In the, in the textbook, it talked about eyewitness testimony and why kids troubles with autobiographical memory makes the eyewitness testimony in court of kids less reliable. Uh, I didn't really touch on the textbook went really deep into that. I kind of kept that out of this presentation because I had so much that I wanted to fit in. Um, 
but it's kind of interesting, right? We talked about everything else except that. Uh, number 10, critical thinking, creative thinking. We talked about metacognition. Researchers have yet to agree on the best definition of intelligence, right? We've talked about how sometimes um, children belong to various special populations. We talked about learning disabilities. And then this idea of, I want to just end, then we'll just end this with these last couple points around language development, that young children increase their grasp of knowledge, the rules, morphology, stuff like that. The terms of the phrenology, children become more sensitive to the sounds of the spoken language. Burko's study with that wug and wugs is a classic one to demonstrate that young people understand morphology rules. As preschool children learn and apply the rules of syntax, and they start to learn how the words should be ordered, they start to understand the words, that increases their vocabulary. Young kids, uh, come, as that vocabulary increases, then that has a kind of applied effect on increasing their conversational skills. And that, that all that stuff is related to early development of literacy and later long-term psychological, or sorry, academic success. And you survived the presentation. We're done chapter five. I'll see you soon with chapter six. I love this class. You're great. I hope that was okay. Two hours and... 35 minutes or so but uh chapter six coming soon giants of psychology marks coming soon for you all right cheers